And thanks everyone for taking time out of your day to uh, listen to the revision uh, that we went through for the fundamentals of stats text. Um, I have a, a lot to go over with you because the revision was pretty, pretty significant. The revision is really based on two things overall. One is things that we changed within the text itself, and then things that we changed, updated in the, the media, in the MyLab course. So what I wanna do is start with some of the things that changed within the, the text itself, then I'll jump to the, the MyLab and, and media. The, the four major points that I wanna to talk to about the text is that one of the things that we wanted to do with this, with this revision is allow students to work with a single data set throughout the entire curriculum so that they could see how the different tools that we're giving the students apply to a single data set. And in that regard, it's, it's threaded throughout the course, which allows uh, students to ultimately develop a semester long project by going through these various exercises. Another thing that's taking place within the introductory statistics market is that there's a lot of folks that are teaching inference using simulation and randomization methods. And because this is a new concept within the introductory course, I decided to add this as optional material for those of you that would like to try uh, implementing some of these methods within your course. And then because it's optional, it wouldn't impact those that wanna maintain the traditional type course that, that we offer. As always, I go through and update all the uh, dated uh, exercises and the dated data sets. And so there's over 350 new and updated exercises and over hundred new and updated uh, examples. In the physical text itself on the front inside cover, you're going to see the different types of data problems that we have in there that are uh, sort of themed. One is of course the putting it together sections that's listed in the front inside cover. And then there are putting it together problems which uh, tie concepts from a given section back to earlier sections as well. But new to this edition are these threaded tornado problems. You'll see a list of them on the inside cover of the textbook, along with all the topics that exist within, within the, uh, or all the topics that are covered for that particular problem. So let me show you what this, these types of problems will look like in, in the textbook. So you'll see right here, problem number 15 in section 4.3 is a threaded tornado problem. And so the student would uh, download the, the data from either the Pearson Higher Ed Sullivan Stats website uh, and open the tornado's 2017 data. So essentially what this data is, is many, many variables measured for every single tornado that struck the US in 2017. And so it's a very large data set with a lot of different variables measured, including things like the uh, uh, Fujita scale, the F0, the F scale, uh, the length of the tornado, the width of the tornado, whether there were fatalities or how many fatalities and a variety of other, the state that the tornado was in, things of that nature. And so it was, because it's such a robust data set, it allows me to ask questions in almost every single chapter on, on this data set. So like here, students are pretty much doing everything you possibly can do for bivariate quantitative data within one, within one exercise. Or here, let's see, is it, here it is in chapter nine, where we're doing um, confidence intervals for, for uh, the F0 scale, for the F scale, whether it's a zero or, or not. And so, if you look carefully here, we are doing random samples of different tornadoes, which allows students to see that the confidence interval can change from one sample to another within a given uh, problem set. And again, they see how different concepts can be, or questions can be answered throughout the entire, throughout the entire course. The other thing about these threaded tornado problems is that they exist within the MyLab course as well. So what I did is created a complete MyLab course for your school. 
And so all you have to do is, I go to details, feel free to copy the course by using the course ID Sullivan 92313, Sullivan 92313. Uh, that course ID is also in, in the PowerPoint. I'm pretty sure, I don't know where the heck I put it now. Oh, there it is. The course ID Sullivan 92313 uh, for you. And so in that course, I open it up. What I did, is if I go to assignments here, I actually built out homework sets for every single section for you. I built out practice tests. On, from the practice tests, we have what was, was called mastery homework, which is essentially personalized homework for the practice exam and then an actual exam as well. This is based on the structure of the course that I teach it at my school. So I, I offer uh, four exams through, during the course of the during the course of the semester. What I wanted to show you is under I didn't assign these, but under course tools, assignment manager. If we look at, under homework, at the very end of this list of homework, I created a list of the different new problem types that exist within the my lab, and so here under tornado problems is a list of some of the tornado problems that exist within the my lab course. So here's the, the 4.3 problem that I just showed you in the textbook. Here it is programmed as well in my lab for you. And so now I can open up the data set so you can see this is just two variables, the width and the length of the tornado for that one year, 2017. So I just wanna show you that we have all the tornado problems in the MyLab course. Also within the text, as I mentioned to you, is uh, we have simulation and randomization sections. Here's a list of these sections. So I have a section on estimating probabilities using prob simulation in section 5.6. I have hypothesis tests for a proportion in chapter 10, hypothesis tests for a mean using simulation and bootstrap in chapter 10, and then the randomization or permutation methods is sometimes what they're referred to as well. So that you can see where these are within the MyLab course. If you go under the, the e-text, you'll see, for example, chapter 10, there's section 10.2a. Uh, for each of these sections, I have videos for you. I also have a complete e-text. So this is not in the physical text, so you have to use it in the, in the e-text. So here it is, we're introducing hypothesis testing on a proportion using simulation, and then 10.2b uh, follows it up with using the normal model to do hypothesis tests. So you can see that this is technology driven. It primarily uses StatCrunch as the, as the tool. Again, any of the simulation methods are optional. They're not in the physical textbook. They're only available in the e-text. There are, it's uh, because it's the text it has as always, um, end of section exercise is available along with the answers, which vary depending on the seed that you use. But here's the end of section exercises. And there are my lab exercises that go with this as well. So there we tell students what seed to use so that we are able to grade, to grade the results. That is really what we did in the, in the text. What I do want to do is focus on the MyLab because media is where our students are really learning the material, especially in today's uh, world. So in the MyLab, here are the things that I did. I added new real data-based problems. I'm going to show you what they look like. They're pretty slick. I added applet problems and we have uh, new videos. So 
here I'm just listing some of the real database problems, but I think it's easier and better to show you what these look like. So let me go back to the, the MyLab course and then go back to the assignment manager because also in your University of North Georgia course, I created a little exercise set. Oh, the video is in the way, hold on a sec there. There we go. So here's some, uh, some examples of real database problems. I use my lab exclusively in my courses and I realize some of the shortcomings that the product has. In stats, the, and well in, in my labs in general, the data, their problems are algorithmically uh, generated. And so you can't use real database problems in that scenario because you're algorithmically generating the data. And so the data isn't real for a given scenario. In other words, you can't say in the United States, Harris polls did da 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 because you would be changing their, their data, which would make it you know false, right? And so what I've done is, I'll just show you an example. I went and found large data sets and told Pearson how to write algorithms so that we would randomly sample from those larger data sets to create smaller data sets. And that would allow different students to get different data based on a real problem. So like, for example, in the city of Chicago, we have red light cameras that take pictures of people's license plates if they have any kind of moving violation. And so here is data based on a much larger data set for red light violations recorded on a particular day, in this case, October 17th, 2018. What's nice about these is we are now able to present scenarios based on real authentic data sets rather than a city has certain cameras installed and the data is sort of made up. So I wrote these from scratch, which also give, gives them a little bit more uh, depth. So that's the kind of problems that we have. So like here in chapter four, section two, this is actual home runs hit in major league games in 2018. Here's the data. It's the speed of a ball leaving the bat as well as how far the ball traveled for a home run. And you can see that the students are answering all kinds of questions based on the authentic real data. So I think that that's a very powerful addition to the MyLab course. Another thing that we added in order to engage students are applet exercises. You may be familiar with the fact that there are applet exercises within the uh, StatCrunch program. What I did is wrote problems using these applets and then ask, have the students answer questions based on their experience with the, with the applet. And so once again, I built some of these for you to play around with. What you'll see is that these problems are easily identified from your assignment manager where they say app one, app two, so on and so forth. So for example, here in section 4.1, we're using the correlation by I applet. And so the applet opens up and then the students would answer questions based on the directions that we, that we gave. So like here, I tell the students to hit reset and then draw a scatter diagram with positive association. And then we show the correlation coefficient and the students learn that positively associated variables have a positive correlation coefficient, uh, et cetera. I mean, I don't have to teach you that, uh, but this exercise takes students through that. And so you could include this as part of an assignment in your MyLab course so that students can learn the properties of correlation coefficient through experience rather than through a video or, or say a lecture. Um, the chapter nine applet exercise shows the power or the meaning of, of level of confidence in constructing a confidence interval. 
Um, these chapter eight applets are pretty powerful because if you haven't used the sampling distribution applets in, in StatCrunch, they're pretty darn slick. It's like here we build a population and you can sample from the population. So there's a sample size two, it finds the mean. You know, students do this a couple times and then you have them do it a thousand times and they can see that the distribution of X bar is approximately normal when you sample from a population that's normal. And then you can do stuff like draw in your own population. And again, the students can play around and see the role that sample size plays in the shape of the distribution of X bar. So pretty slick and this applet exercise uh, drives that, that content for the students. Another thing that I've been using my lab for is exams. And what I prefer to have happen in my exams is students actually have to write out uh, solutions rather than just fill in blanks or do multiple choice. And so I added all kinds of essay exercise questions throughout the MyLab course. And so now if you go back to the assignment manager, I built out a list of these essay problems. So you can see a sample of them as well. There are many, many essay questions per, per section, but I just wanted to give you an example of a couple of them. Like this is section 1.6 on design of experiments, rather than these being multiple choice type questions, they're all free response. I give these in an exam setting, you would have to grade them then by hand. But what I like about this is students actually have to type out written responses rather than doing any kind of multiple choice. So that's one example, or here, here's one from chapter nine where we're constructing a confidence interval. So the students actually have to do the interpretation of the confidence interval within the, within the essay box. That way they're not just you know, again, doing multiple choice interpretations of the results. So I think that that's a powerful addition or any kind of assessment that you may want to use my lab for. There's also a lot of new video that exists within this course. Uh, first and foremost, I have video that shows that has animations. So, um, whoops, let me just go back to the PowerPoint. So this particular animation is from chapter four. Um, it basically is an, in, these exist almost at the beginning of every single section and then sometimes they're interspersed within the section. Like I know I have an animation on type one versus type two errors. So that's supposed to be a little avatar of me. So it's my voice in these animations. In addition to that, you'll sometimes see an avatar of my wife. I gave her a script and she, we had a dialogue back and forth as part of the animation as well. So that's kind of fun. We also added what are called light board videos. So these are of me. I was uh, in a studio writing on a, a piece of glass and doing a presentation of concepts. So here I'm explaining how the correlation coefficient measures strength of uh, linear association between two quantitative variables. So that's a nice addition. Um, we, uh, in the survey, we saw that we have some Excel users at, at, uh, on campus. And so for every single example in the text that warrants it, there is now a, an Excel video solution. So ex Excel is part of the suite of video solutions that exist. So now you have video solutions for every example by hand using the TI, using StatCrunch and using Excel. And all of these videos, so we know where we're looking for them, are under the video resource library. So you just click video resource library, the chapter, and maybe even the section that you're interested in, then video. And there you can see there's the animations, there's me teaching from my classroom lectures, and then here are all the different examples. So there you can see correlation coefficient using Excel, StatCrunch, TI, so on and so forth. So you can include these actually as part of your course as media assignments. Okay, I feel like I feel like that late night commercial selling Ginsu knives because there's more. So besides all those updates in the MyLab course, we also created a, a variety of uh, ancillaries. One ancillary that's new to this edition is the classroom notes. 
So the classroom notes are easily found in your MyLab course. I, I put them right here for you so that your students can actually grab these notes. Let me explain what these are. The classroom notes essentially serve as cliff notes for a lecture. Like I use these for my Zoom calls with my students. These classroom lecture notes get opened up and then I can fill them in using my tablet PC as I go through all the content. So what you can see here is that it's the essentially the outline exactly from the textbook. This way students don't have to spend time writing down definitions and theorems. But then when you go through an example, the students would fill that in or you would fill it in while you're going through your Zoom call or uh, eventually when you're back, back in the classroom. I save these and then share them with my students. And there's all the examples that are in these classroom notes are different from the examples from the textbook or from the instructor resource guide. And so even if you were given this class one day prior to having to teach it, you have lecture notes ready to rock and roll uh, for you and for your, for your students. We also have an updated classroom activity guide. So there's an, um, here are some of the new activities that exist in the activity workbook. Uh, what does it mean to regress to the mean is based on the Galton data uh, with uh, fathers and sons heights. So students learn that what the phrase regress to the mean actually means. Uh, tennis anyone just talks about the, uh, the effect of the law of large numbers when if you're in a three or a five game set, how it, the five game set benefits the, the stronger player. Um, uh, sensitivity and specificity was written as a result of, of the pandemic. Students hear a lot about uh, sensitivity and specificity of these new drugs that have been coming out, the vaccines. So we uh, elaborate on what those words mean in terms of uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, the general's dilemma is based on psychologists and Kahneman. That's kind of a fun one to go through as a data collection uh, project. I also have an outline for a semester long project as well as um, the, how to develop a stat crunch survey. If you want to have your students write survey questions, administer the survey and then use that data throughout the semester to illustrate certain concepts. So the, the student activity workbook is available also in your course on the main navigation page, here is the, the student activity workbook. There's a complete table of contents available so you can pick and choose what activities you would wanna use. These activities also have, there's an instructor guide that goes with this as well that tells you how you might wanna divvy up the, break your students into small groups. Like if you're using Zoom, send the students into different um, some breakout rooms. Uh, as well as how much time each of these should take. So I think these are really effective for developing conceptual understanding as well. So the other ancillaries, I'm gonna skip learning catalytics, come back to it shortly. Um, I do have a website called sullystats.com that also has a variety of resources for you. So here it is, sullystats.com. One thing that I wanna point out to our, the R user uh, in the group, if you click on the statistics six ebook, the one that's red, and you scroll down, here's an R guidebook. And so this shows our code for every single topic taught within the course up through inference on categorical data. I'm still working on the rest, but these are all hyperlinked. It also shows the code for using uh, simulation and randomization methods if you want as well. And so, for example, here's the code for using, doing least squares regression. Uh, a lot of this data can be just uploaded directly into R. I also have a GitHub site, so you can use the GitHub site to grab the data that you want as well. I also heard that some of you are interested in more engagement in the classroom. We, for this course, have a complete learning catalytics modules built. So let me show you those. If you're not familiar with learning catalytics, learning catalytics is essentially a online clicker system. 
it's included in the price of the MyLab access. And so there's no additional cost for using this. It's web-based, so students can access these whether they're in your classroom or not, as long as they are associated with your course. So first and foremost, if any of you are interested in the material, uh, I can ju just send me an email and I will share or send you my course so that you can play around with it. Just make sure you give me the email associated with your MyLab account, otherwise it won't work. But you can see for every single chapter, I have a wide variety of exercises that I wrote that you can use to uh, drive uh, questions for your students. So literally all you do is open these courses up and then, and then start a session. The students would log in and then they would enter this number in order to access your course. And again, they could be anywhere. Um, when I was teaching live, I had a student that lived in Poland. Her father-in-law passed away. She didn't want to miss our class from Poland. She logged in and was answering questions on learning catalytics with the rest of the class. So that's kind of slick. And then you would just deliver these questions to the students uh, when, when you're, when you're ready. I mean, obviously there's a whole session on how to do learning catalytics that I could have. Again, I think that lots and lots of questions that we wrote, I wrote with the help of George Woodbury that go directly with this, this, this text. I can say from experience that learning catalytics is one heck of a powerful tool. While I did an analysis of before learning catalytics and after learning catalytics in my classes, and while my average grades only went up about one or two points, my standard deviation on my exams prior to using learning catalytics was about 15. After using ca learning catalytics, my standard deviation went down to eight. So the strong students are going to be strong no matter what, we know that. What learning catalytics does is allow for peer-to-peer -peer instruction and that peer-to-peer -peer instruction helps out the weaker students and maybe brings them from a D student to a, to a C student. And that's what I think I would attribute to the lower standard deviation after introducing learning catalytics to the class. And again, I wrote all these questions so they go with this textbook. So that's a pretty, pretty powerful supplement as well. Um, one of the things that's happening around the country is that uh, more and more states are doing away with or trying to minimize the number of students that have to work their way through a developmental math or remedial math program. And so now what we're starting to see is that uh, courses are being offered where any kind of remediation takes place within the, the corresponding college level course. And so I have complete integrated review materials as part of this course as well. What's nice is that all of this content that I'm about to show you, I did it again, all of this content I'm about to show you is based on my developmental math material. And so there's a common author voice between the developmental material and the, and the statistics material. This material is woven directly into the the course. So if you don't want to use this, you can just hide it. But if you do want to use it, so like chapter one is getting ready for chapter two of fundamentals. So while the students are going, learning how to going through chapter one, where they're learning about design of experiments and so on, they're simultaneously reviewing the arithmetic skills they need in order to be successful in, in chapter uh, two of stats. Within any given section, I have video, I have a textbook, and we have worksheets, and there are MyLab exercises. So this is an out-of-the-box program that you're looking at right now. You can, you can play around with it, but plenty of resources to assist your students. Like, for example, when students are going through uh, correlation and regression, they might not remember slope and things of that nature, so you might direct them to this section 3.ir3 on how to find slope, how to interpret slope, or things like what the slope-intercept formal line is, the point-slope formal line, so on and so forth. 
So this is a, a great just-in-time review of content that students need in order to be successful within the corresponding uh, STATS course.